to the Oyster Stew Podcast. I'm Bob Mooney, General Counsel for Oyster Consulting. Thanks for joining us for the second of two podcasts covering the current state of the DOL PTE 2020-02. Oyster's Ed Wagner continues his discussion with DOL PTE experts Fred Reich, David Porteous, and Joan Neary from the law firm of Fagri, Drinker, Biddle, and Reith. In February, a U.S. District Court judge challenged the DOL's FAQs around the fiduciary investment advice definition to rollover recommendations. Today, our experts will be discussing this case and other legal challenges and the impacts these will have, if any. Let's pick up where we left off. Taking this back to, to where we are currently, you know, this, this has been a, a very long and winding road going back to the best interest contract exemption. And, and along that long and winding road, you know, there oftentimes are court challenges uh, to the rules. And, and there was a court challenge specifically around the application of um, uh, the, the PTE to uh, rollover recommendations and the guidance that was in um, the FAQs. Um, can, can you talk about the, the court challenge, the results of the, the court challenge, the impact and, and where things stand right now? Yeah, I'll, I'll kick it off and then I'll turn it over to, to Fred and David. But um, yeah, this was a, a lawsuit brought by the American Securities Association. It was a federal district court um, that weighed in on this. And as you said, it was specific to rollover recommendations. I, there was a lot of confusion by many of my clients and they thought that there was a broader impact here. But uh, what the, what the uh, plaintiff focused on in this case was um, two, two elements of the guidance that the Department of Labor issued in the form of frequently asked questions in connection with the um, PTE 2020-02. Um, and, and those two questions, I'll dispose of the first one um, uh, first, the easier one, because here the court um, agreed that uh, this guidance was, was appropriate. And, um, and the challenge had to do with the application of the best interest process um, in, in carrying out the standard that the PT requires. And, um, and as you said, in particular with respect to rollovers, and this guidance talks about the fact that um, the best interest process should include um, an evaluation of the plan or the IRA that the investor is in and the, and the rollover IRA. Um, and that comparison should look at, at the very least, the services, the fees and the investments, and then all other relevant factors associated with the two the two accounts, and then ultimately um, the, invest, the advisor needs to determine what is in the best interest. And the court said that that's a perfectly appropriate, prudent process for undertaking the standard that the PTE requires. The, the bigger issue has to do with the guidance, the, uh, the, um, the FAQ that had to do with the Department of Labor's reinterpretation of regularly provided, which I, I talked about earlier. And, um, and here the court um, ultimately determined that that interpretation was arbitrary and capricious and should be thrown out. What the court said was that that five part test, which Fred um, re referred to again, um, refers to the plan that the investor is in. So when you're looking at the regularly provided elements you were supposed to be looking at the plan, not at the IRA that the rollover will, will end up in. And therefore, um, a, a rollover recommendation where an advisor has no uh, pre-existing relationship and, and is just anticipating an ex a relationship, a financial relationship in the rollover IRA, well, that's not going to meet regularly provided. Um, so, so that was the, the end result of this court decision, and that left many thinking that they were off the hook with rollover recommendations, but that's not entirely true for a number of reasons. First of all, um, if this court decision were to stand, um, there is guidance the Department of Labor issued back in 2005 on um, on whether uh, rollover is is fiduciary advice, and under that guidance, the Department of Labor drew a distinction between uh, an advisor who has a fiduciary relationship with the plan and one who doesn't. And in the case of an advisor that's already a fiduciary to the plan, and then makes a rollover recommendation to a plan participant, well, that is considered um, fiduciary advice under the 2005 guidance. And so that. 
that certainly wouldn't change. And then also, um, as we mentioned earlier, this court decision only had to do with uh, rollover recommendations, not other non-discretionary advice that um, an advisor may be using the PTE relief for. Um, and the latest news is there is a notice of appeal that um, in, in connection with this. So Fred, let me kick that off to you and you could give a little bit more uh, information on that, the status of that. Sure. Uh, the DOL has just filed a notice of appeal of the Florida District Court decision, uh, which effectively, in my mind at least, puts everything up in the air. Because if people say, I'm going to rely on the Florida District Court decision and stop following PTE 2020-02 because I'm no longer a fiduciary for rollover recommendations, therefore, since I'm not a fiduciary, I don't need the PTE, uh, they're at risk. Because if the Court of Appeals then reverses it, they've got a year or more of non-compliant rollover recommendations that they're not entitled to their compensation on. The broker dealer isn't entitled, the investment advisory firm isn't entitled, and the individual advisors aren't entitled. So plus interest plus penalties. In other words, a no win situation. So the effect is that rollover recommendations are now in a state of limbo. We don't know what to do. We only know that the only safe answer is to continue to comply with PT 2020-02, satisfy the conditions, and just hold on and wait. Um, I would also point out, as Joan did, that we've really got to talk about PT 2020-02 in three categories. One is ongoing advice to retirement plans. If you have ongoing advice to retirement plans and you have a privative transaction, for example, you're a fiduciary, that makes you a non-discretionary fiduciary to the plan because every year you're making recommendations, buy, sell, or hold the investments in the plan, explicit or implied recommendations, you're a fiduciary. And if you're getting commissions or revenue sharing of some kind, some compensation on it, that's a private transaction and you need 2020-02. Same thing for IRAs, where you're more likely to find ongoing advice with commissions and other uh, compensation coming from third parties. Prohibited transactions, you need PT 2012. Those two, plans and IRAs, are not at issue. That's not what the court cases were about. That that seems to be set in stone now. You need PTE 2002 if you satisfy the five-part test. So we're only talking about rollover recommendations. So when I say because of the notice of appeal, things are in limbo, I'm talking about rollover recommendations. There is no limbo for advice to plans and advice to IRAs. Uh, so there we sit. We, we, we don't know what the uh, Court of Appeals is going to decide. We don't know if it might be an appeal to the Supreme Court, uh, which could mean three years from now, we're still waiting for an answer. We're just gonna go into a phase where uh, the safe answer, the conservative answer is continue to comply, satisfy the conditions of PTE 2020-02, uh, so that no matter what the outcome of the court decision is, you're on solid ground. Uh, solid legal ground. So that's where I think we are, Ed. I, I, I don't see an alternative. I mean, people could take risk and say, okay, I'm not going to comply, but gee, who wants to expose themselves to hundreds or thousands of prohibited transactions? Well, it's also, you got to consider the SEC requirements too around rollovers, which, which definitely cover rollovers, whether that's Reg BI or the fiduciary requirements for investment advisors. You know, so trying to parse that out would be, would be really challenging. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, I regret not mentioning that. I'm glad you did. Uh, if folks look back to the SEC staff bulletin on standard of care from last year, from 2022, uh, they, they will... Be, I think they'll find it remarkable how much the SEC position parallels the DOL position. You don't have to, you don't have to uh, have the specific reasons in writing why the rollover is in the best interest. That's not an SEC position, although they do say that you might want to document things. Uh, and there's no private right of action as there is with ERISA, uh, but everything else is the same. You got to look at the plan, the way Joan described it, the investment services expenses in the plan. You got to look at the IRA. You got to do a comparative analysis. You have to decide what's in the best interest of the investor. That's the same for DOL, SEC for broker dealers, and SEC for investment advisors. It, it did seem really, in reading that bulletin, it really seemed like the language was very intentional. <laughs> you almost get the idea they're talking to each other, <laughs> don't you? 
Absolutely. Well, you know, and one of the things that, that you mentioned, and, and, you know, because we're in mid-April and, and June is fast approaching, that's going to be important for firms to do in complying with the requirements is this retrospective review requirement. And I do want to turn to that. And it's one of the areas that we've been interacting with our clients probably most often um, of late in terms of um, their requirements around the DOL. And so we've been engaging with clients to, to do testing of their program um, in the lead up to this this June requirement date, um, and, and Dave, I'll, I'll uh, talk about you know what we've been looking for in terms of the testing and the approach that we've been taking. But I'd like to get your thoughts too, because I know that you do um, a lot of guidance with your clients with respect to testing, whether it's broker dealers or investment advisors, and now with this retrospective review. Um, but the approach that we've taken is very similar to the approach that we take in other types of testing. We've, um, you know, we first focus on making sure that the firm has um, well-written and appropriate policies and procedures, then testing to make sure that those procedures are being effectively implemented, and then any certifications that are required, making sure that that's done. Um, and so with respect to that, that approach, you know, what we've been um, looking for is assessing the policies and procedures and make sure that they covered all of those elements that Joan um, talked about, whether it's the uh, impartial conduct standards, the um, the requirements for disclosures, um, everything that's required, making sure that the firm has adequate procedures, making sure that any assumptions that are um, in the procedures regarding the applicability of the exemption, like we talked about, um, no recommendations or education only, um, making sure that those assumptions are correct and that they're supported and documented, making sure that there's effective training of the firm's policies and procedures so the people who are in the field um, understand what the um, requirements are when um, utilizing the exemption, and then starting the testing, testing to make sure that things are implemented effectively, making sure disclosures are made and made on time, making sure testing to make sure recommendations are in the customer's best interest, um, assessing rollover recommendations, making sure that those assessments are done and that they're adequately documented and the disclosures are made. Um, and importantly, making sure that communications aren't misleading, um, testing compensation, making sure that it's reasonable, and then creating that draft report so that it can be reviewed by the firm and then um, ultimately certified by the appropriate member of, of senior management. So that's the approach that we've been taking with firms. Um, as we get closer and closer to June, we anticipate we'll probably be doing a lot more of these, but my advice would be to try to start early because I think especially with this first round, um, there's gonna be a lot of questions that come up as part of this process and then make sure that you leave yourself enough time to address any of those questions um, in advance of, of the deadline. Um, David, in, in terms of your experience with uh, brokers, dealers, investment advisors, other clients, um, what are some of the effective practices you've seen with testing and what are some of the questions that you get? Yeah, I'd say the, the, the biggest question really is, is how much is enough? And, and this is ultimately a numbers game. And what I see is a divergence of practice between firms for which, let's say you have a small sales force, for lack of a better term, in terms of IARs or registered reps or, or both. And, and if the ratio of, of the sales force to, let's say, supervisory and or compliance personnel is, is, is manageable, the number of transactions given your client base is manageable. I, given all of the implementation you described at the front end, adequate policies and procedures, good training, good documentation practices, that type of hygiene, then then it's going to make it a bit easier to say, look, we're we're not going to screen and supervise every transaction on a on a pre-transaction closing basis. Meaning, recommendation occurs, paperwork is created, and then it's passed to what in the brokerage world we call a supervising principal for review pre pre closing of the transaction instead you're going to say look we'll allow the people the freedom given all of the training and the paperwork that we put into this and the adequacy of our procedures we're going to rely upon that system and we're not going to review every transaction by transaction on the front end we're going to rely upon a system post transaction of testing and it, it's all a numbers game in terms of that that quantitatively i've heard some firms saying we're, we're requiring documentation for every transaction we're not going education only 
and we're going to pre-review every transaction prior to it closing by a supervising principal at least put eyeballs on it as compared to circumstances in which that's just not um, feasible given given human capital we just don't have enough people um, and the number of transactions you might be reviewing and and uh, recommending on a on a daily basis is too voluminous for us to put eyeballs on every transaction so we're going to rely upon a system of testing after the fact okay fair enough then if if that that quantity is 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 that substantial then this quality of your testing practices is going to have to be risk tuned right you know what what are particular types of transactions that we're going to be more focused upon um, a certain type of client base, a certain type of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a complete rollover from a plan to an IRA compared to an IRA to an IRA. Uh, you know, given our documentation, where have we had a, a bit more issues where there were some questions and, and devising a testing process that is ultimately risk-based such that um, <clears throat> you can defend it after the fact. But I think leading to a 12-month annual retrospective, what best practices I've seen borrowed from the brokerage world is at a minimum you're doing a 90-day retrospective review on a risk base as we just discussed some statistically significant sample um, you know that that's going to vary from firm to firm I can't give you a specific number but you can certainly use a percentage model and then make it very risk focused hey we, we targeted this bucket but we're doing it every 90 days. So then that way, at the end of the 12 month period, you know, you're having the conversation much as happens in the broker dealer world to say, our annual certification is predicated upon four quarters of testing. And here's the output we got as a consequence of each of those quarters of testing. And as we had certain deficiencies or, or corrections that we needed to make, what did we do in response so that those numbers hopefully ebb down heading into the first annual retrospective review as compared to saying, yeah, it didn't go so great first quarter, got even worse second quarter, man, third quarter just blew up. And it's like, well, what, what are you doing in response to the data that you're getting? Because if your testing is giving you an output that says somebody's not understanding something, the quality of the recommendations and the, new, the number of times we're going to have to make a correction here are pretty high, that, that is the type of information you want to have at the end of the at the end the one year period to be able to say we we did the testing quarterly is so that we could gauge how well we're doing and implement refreshers inside each of the the 90 day periods after that test in order to figure out how well we're doing and i'll just say on a calendar what i've seen typically you know broker dealer or dual iabd testing usually is they started about 30 to 60 days out from the end of the previous quarter so that at the 90th day they have an analysis of what's been happening in the previous 30 to 60. So it's not just waiting until 90 days and then we'll, we're, we're at 120, 150 to f even find out how well we did. So it's really being a bit rigid with the calendar and then trying to slice off a percentage. Those are all really important points. And you know, one of the things I would say is, and, and this is anytime you're doing testing, is that the, the annual testing is not a replacement for regular monitoring. You should be doing regular monitoring and making sure that you're identifying issues and, as you said, addressing those when those things come up. I think that that's um, really critical distinction and make sure that you understand is not, you know, set it, forget it, and then do the annual um, the annual testing. And we're going to talk about self-correction later, and this kind of gets into that and the timing around that. Um, the other thing, though, I used to have this question a lot when I worked at FINRA and we'd send out, we'd send examiners out to do examinations. And it was the same question, like when we're talking about testing, what's enough? And you have to really look at, well, what's the purpose of the testing? Is you want to come away from that, that testing feeling reasonably confident that you don't have major issues. So the testing, when it comes to the, the numbers and how much is enough testing, it's at that point where you feel comfortable that your, your process is working and that you're identifying any issues that need to be addressed. So um, in, in terms of the representative sample, just like you said, I mean, that number is going to vary depending on a lot of factors, but you want to make sure that it's enough where you're getting a good representation of the transactions that are subject to these requirements. Um, and then, you know, the risk based portion of that, too, is in addition to just doing a, a random uh, 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 
uh, representative sample, you also want to understand, well, where are the risks that we're probably more likely to have issues and make sure that you're doing testing in those areas just to make sure that you're, you're comfortable in those areas. And what you really want to do is come away with a report of saying we've identified the things um, that need to be addressed. We have a plan to fix those issues and that the, uh, you're giving the person who's signing off on that certification a comfort level that they feel comfortable in, in providing that certification. So um, it'll be interesting. I, I think the first round of testing on this, you know, there probably like to be found a number of issues that need to be addressed as firms address those. I think subsequent years will probably go a lot smoother. Um, and but I, I also think that as we go through this, a lot of interpretive questions will come up that you need to you know reach out to your counsel, uh, like the three of you to, to say, hey, we've got this question that's come up as part of our testing. How should we address that? Um, I do want to um, end on, on the question with respect to self-correction. So, and it kind of follows on, you're doing regular monitoring, you're doing um, retrospect, annual retrospective reviews, you find issues where you may not have been 100% compliance. What, what's the next step and what is the DOL expecting in terms of what to do in those situations and when is self-correction required? Yeah, Ed, let me jump in on this one. Um, I mean, the basic answer is simple. You're supposed to fix it, and you're supposed to report yourself to the Department of Labor. There's a whole process in PT 2020-02 that gives you the timeline for doing that. But uh, but there is a process, and there is a, a, a site where you, an email address where you would send your, your uh, report. I would say in doing that, in, in notifying the Department of Labor of the error and the correction, I would make a big point of pointing out all the steps you've taken to generally be in compliance, because it's important that the department understand that this was an exception. This is something that happened notwithstanding your training, your policies and procedures, and and all the things, all the forms, everything you've done along the way. Uh, They're gonna look at it differently if they think that this indicates a lack of seriousness, as opposed to whether whether they think what you're reporting is an accident that happened even though you've made a really serious effort to comply. So that's sort of lesson number one. And you have to, you don't get the relief if you don't self-report, period. Uh, Now, how do you correct? That's really the big issue. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, you can't put the money back in the plan. Once a participant has left a plan, you can't roll money back into a plan where they don't work there anymore and they don't have an account balance in the plan anymore. So you're sort of stuck. Uh, The errors that that I've consulted with clients on vary anything from, I failed to give the fiduciary acknowledgement. One one client I helped uh, failed to give the fiduciary acknowledgement in about 100 cases uh, to a lot, but it was a computer glitch and they fixed it. And their base of recommendations is in the thousands. So it wasn't quite as big as it sounded like at first. there's no guidance on how to correct. The client ended up deciding to go and distribute the fiduciary acknowledgements to all of those people. Nobody objected, so they didn't have to deal with the second half of the issue, which is what if somebody had objected, you know, because they didn't get it on a timely basis. But in that case, it, it seems like for the disclosure documents, one one approach would be to then hand out the disclosures. The difficulty is what happens if they object. Uh, the, the the DOL has not spoken out on that. If they take a really hard line, they could say, even if somebody doesn't object, you got to put them in the, at least as good a position as they would have been in the plan, which probably means dramatically reducing the, the expenses of their investments. But I'm not saying you have to go that far. I'm just saying that's the worst case scenario. Another example is uh, what happens if the investments in the IRA weren't in the best interest of the participant. Never mind the rollover recommendation, but we see that. I mean, you could just think of, well, forget an IRA. Think about a uh, retirement plan where the mutual fund prospectus says, we'll waive front end loads for retirement plans. And it wasn't waived. That would be an example of where a mistake can be made inside the IRA. It would already be a mistake under the securities laws, but it would also be a, a, a fiduciary breach here. Um, and then the, you correct that by getting it back to where it should have been. Uh, you got to fix it. Uh, and then the third thing is um, the 
what if the advisor just didn't engage, did not engage in a best interest process to recommend the rollover, or they did, but they failed to look at the appropriate things, uh, or they did and it just wasn't in the best interest, but they, but they made the recommendation anyway. Um, in that case, that's really hard because let's say it was from a very large 401k plan and the average expense ratio of all the investments in the plan was 15 basis points, which is not inaccurate for the mega plans. Um, well, the only thing I think you can do at that point, since you can't put it back in the plan, is reduce their expenses to 15 basis points. Because I think you have to go back and reconfigure how they're invested so that, that you make the IRA in their best interest, because I don't see any other alternative other than doing that. And then people say, well, how long do we have to do that for? Well, they could have stayed in the plan pretty much forever. So forever. Uh, and we have no guidance. We're, Ed, in, in effect, we're making up answers as we go. Uh, the one thing I would say about the supervision and the retrospective review in this context, though, is that if you're immediately supervising recommendations and you catch that on day one, a bad recommendation is made and it is fixable and you fix it on day one, you've got at least an argument that passes the laugh test that, wait a second, this is a dual responsibility, uh, the best interest process. It's a com combined advisor and broker dealer or, or, or RIA entity, combined individual and entity recommendation. Um, and we fixed it. It's got to go through both fil filters, both the advisor filter and the entity filter before it is a prohibited transaction. And we fixed it before it went through the entity filter. Therefore, it was never a prohibited transaction. I've got some clients that are going to take that approach uh, where they catch it very early. And, and so that it, it, you know, they're not identifying it in the retrospective review a year later. I will say it's not clear that that approach works. But folks are really reluctant to report themselves to the government. And the difference there is they fixed it and they're not reporting themselves to the, to the government. So um, that then gets you to the last thing I wanted to say, which is some clients have said to me, well, Freddie, we're not going to self-report our really little violations. I, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you, Ed, or to Joan, or to David, that there's no such thing as a little violation. <laughs> you know, it's nowhere in the PTE or the word, there's a word little up here. There, it's either a violation or it's not. And if you want it corrected, fully corrected, such that you can't be second guessed by the Department of Labor, then you've got to report it through that process that I described earlier. So that's where we're going. I mean, we're sort of feeling our way on this one because there's no guidance on what self-correction means. It just, and, and the most obvious, putting the money back in the plan simply isn't available. So, you sort of have to make it up inside the IRA when it's a rollover recommendation. Well, I think all the more reason to make sure that you have a really good set of policies and procedures and monitoring efforts to make sure that you're catching these things right away and being able to um, take corrective action as soon as possible. And then, um, uh, it, and if there's any question, to reach out to your counsel um, and and talk about what needs to be done. Um, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate um, all of your um, uh, your points and, and the discussion, Joan, Fred, and David. And um, I'm sure there's going to be more to come. And I look forward to having future conversations uh, in, in the near future. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks for listening, everyone. And we'd like to thank Joan, David, and Fred for sharing their expertise with us. If you'd like to learn more about how Oyster can help you navigate the DOL PTE or conduct your required annual review, visit our website at oysterllc.com. If you would like to contact the experts from Fagri, please visit fagridrinker.com.